So good morning everybody and welcome again to uh, GW and to L.D. Elliott School. And I'm really honored and very pleased to welcome Ambassador Shringala here. Uh, you know, since we are in a university, let me reveal that we are from the same college. <laughs> and we have had uh, many, we've served in many parts of the world. Uh, in similar places, although never at the same time. So it gives me real double and triple pleasure to be with him here today uh, and welcome him and welcome him to uh, the GW, to the Elliott School, and to this uh, event. We are really looking forward to uh, hearing from you. Um, let me, uh, it's, it's considered a kind of fireside chat, although there's no fire uh, place per se, but uh, it will be a very, uh, not a very hot conversation, a very pleasant conversation, I hope. Let me just say a few brief words about this report. Uh, you know, last year, the FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, um, which is probably the largest uh, federation of chambers of commerce and industry in India. Uh, the, the management, the presidium of FICI 
got together and said, let's, um, let's also prepare uh, a, a kind of vision for India. We have, of course, the government prepares the economic survey, the Reserve Bank of India has its survey, um, but the private sector in India didn't have a, a kind of a, a, you know, documented, coherent view of where India should be going. So the Presidium got together and decided to produce this report and said, let's make it a little bit more long-term, like up to 2030, and then asked me to come and help put this together. So this is the report. It was launched um, by the Finance Minister of India uh, at the last AGM of the Federation of Chambers of Commerce. It's, uh, India is, uh, you know, at a very interesting point, and what we thought was we could look at what are the challenges that India faces. Today, India will be uh, probably this year the fifth largest economy in the world in dollar terms, and with an aim to reach nine to ten trillion dollars by 2030, we could make it easily the third largest economy in the world. So what this report tries to do is ask the question, what kind of challenges will India face? What are the major policy issues that uh, will have to be addressed? What kind of investments will be needed? And how will we mobilize ourselves to be able uh, to do that? Based on this report, uh, a shorter set of recommendations has now been prepared and again presented to the finance minister last week. And it's also being shared by all the political parties in India because we have a major election coming uh, soon. It's just been announced. And so Fiki has decided to present this agenda which emerged from this report to all the political parties uh, at the same time. So that's just by way of background that we are very happy that this report was launched by the finance minister in, uh, in Delhi for India, and we are, I'm very happy that Ambassador Shrigla will basically launch this report for us uh, for Fiki in Washington. So thank you very much for that, Ambassador Shrigla. Can we have Maybe a we could just get up and take a picture of the report. Then. Thank you so much. So uh, let me turn to you, Ambassador, and again to say that uh, with your very distinguished career that uh, 9010 uh, laid out for us and a very key position that you hold today, here, how do you see India's prospects? India, as, you, as I said, is now this year probably, is now the sixth largest world economy, going to overtake UK to become the fifth largest. Our goal is to reach nine to ten trillion dollars. We have, uh, of course, uh, reduced poverty very substantially in India. You know, one of my colleagues here, James uh, Foster, is the pioneer of something called multi-dimensional poverty, which measures poverty in various dimensions. He's not here today, but his work has shown, and that analysis for India has shown that there's been a huge reduction in poverty. And also some of the more backward uh, communities have actually done <coughs> quite well. So I just wanted to um, open it up by asking you, how do you see India's prospects? What challenges do you see uh, that will propel us to this uh, third largest economy? And how, what, are, what are the aims and goals of well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shiva. Um, let me begin by congratulating the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industries in general, and you as the chief economist of PP uh, in particular for uh, the very timely release of this uh, comprehensive and far-sighted publication <coughs> in India 2030. Um, as you mentioned, we're very happy that the finance minister himself released the book in New Delhi. Uh, and I'm also uh, very happy that uh, PP has decided to release this publication in the United States because the U.S. is our number one trading partner. It's a very important partner country in terms of mutual investment, both Indian investments in the United States and U.S. investments in India. Uh, and uh, I think much of the credit for this 
police has to go to PP's very dynamic representative Vidika Bhattu. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of some of our distinguished uh, MVPs, uh, Dr. Sudhir Gokarna, Executive Director of the IMF, Adrian Mutton. Uh, my outstanding colleagues, uh, Minister Economic uh, Manish uh, Chawla and Minister Thomas Puneet, both of whom have worked very closely with me in our outreach activities in the economic and commercial field. Um, so clearly, um, from what I can see, uh, the publication lays out for us not only <coughs> the sort of uh, economic development uh, that we have experienced, but also uh, provides a very uh, comprehensive assessment of how we can take this uh, forward over the next 10, 15 years, what we should look forward to, and more importantly, what we need to do to get uh, to the goals that we have set for ourselves. Um, and I think uh, if you look at uh, where we stand today, uh, in the last few years, of course we've come a long way since our independence. As you know, GDP, uh, we accounted for 3% of the global GDP in 1947 when we became independent. Uh, today we account for close to 9%. Uh, we are going at the rate of about 7.6% uh, today. Our GDP growth accounts for 17% of global growth. Um, having said that, of course, uh, we've made huge strides in the last five years. I think it's been transformational the way we have grown. Um, if you look at the fundamentals of the Indian economy today, uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, in many senses, uh, you know, one of the strongest emerging, uh, major emerging economies. Our uh, inflation, and inflation is a very key indicator of where the economy lies, uh, has come down from over, uh, rate of inflation has come from over 10% years ago to about 4.6% uh, today. Uh, our fiscal deficit uh, has come down uh, from over 6% to about 3.4%. These are very important indicators. Uh, inflation is also seen as an unfair tax on the middle class and the poor. So bringing down inflation, bringing down fiscal deficit is good governance and good management of the economy. And of course, uh, we have been successful in attracting up to $239 billion of foreign direct investment in the last five. 90% of which has come through what we call the automatic route, which means there's no uh, government, no formal government approvals required. You just apply and you get it uh, online. So I think we have made progress. Now, how do we see the future? This is, I think, the question you asked, and how do we get there? Uh, clearly, I think there is a vision that in the next five years, as we all can, we should become a $5 trillion economy. Uh, we are already, we have already grown in the last five years from being the 11th largest economy in the world to being the sixth largest. And this year we might just become the fifth largest economy. But uh, we see ourselves going to a $5 trillion economy in the next five years, to 2024. And eight years after that, I think we see ourselves as a $10 trillion economy. Of course, uh, when you set goals for yourself, you have to know how to reach them, of course. Uh, we need over 9% growth. Uh, I think Dr. Wokana would agree with me that we need high levels of growth in order to achieve this figure. Um, this publication, I think, uh, envisions in, in about 10 paragraphs a uh, very, very uh, uh, effective pointers as to how the government uh, and how we need to plan to get to that level of growth that we need. Uh, in 2030, where do we need to reach and how do we reach that? And I think it goes across uh, different sectors from uh, you know, the physical and social infrastructure uh, to uh, healthcare, to governance, uh, making sure that, uh, that <coughs> the, um, you know, the uh, factors of the economy are also taken into account, uh, the reforms that we need in labor and the financial markets uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, so this gives you an idea and the good thing of course is that it's, uh, it seems to be very much in convergence with the 10 points that have been envisioned by our Prime Minister yes. on how we should take our own uh, growth and development forward. And let's be very clear that what do we mean, what are our priorities in the economic terms? Uh, growth is one factor, but we also, as you correctly mentioned, poverty alleviation and bringing down poverty levels, or rather eradicating poverty is very important both for the government. And employment creation is very important for a country that is contributing one million persons to the job market every year, which means to say that there are one million people who come into uh, the job market who need uh, employment, and that's a very important so to achieve all of this, uh, I think for us, what is important is not just growth, but we need inclusive and sustainable growth. And the means of achieving inclusive and sustainable growth, of course, have to involve, as we mentioned, uh, a focus on uh, physical and social infrastructure, uh, a focus on developing uh, the small industries and the rural industries.
that we have to uh, uh, focus uh, on ensuring that uh, agriculture and uh, uh, on and of course uh, the rural development food security aspects are taken into account. Uh, also ensuring that uh, climate change and use of renewables is, is focused on. And of course, uh, the important factors are needless to say we need clean uh, rivers, we need drinking water, we need healthcare, we need uh, you know investments in uh, areas like education. Governance is a very important factor. Uh, and of course, to all this, uh, we also have to add uh, Digital India, which is a great priority for the government, uh, and great progress has been made in that sector. And one of the uh, items that the Prime Minister also envisioned is uh, is in the realm of space, uh, space exploration, space mining. Uh, we have uh, the plan to have a uh, manned space, space mission by 2024. So all of these are within the vision of how we would attain uh, the sort of goals and objectives that we're talking about. Wonderful. So since we are so close to uh, uh, the World Bank, let me say that one of the big things that we have seen <coughs> in the last two, three years is this huge improvement in our ranking on the ease of doing business from, I think, 133 to 77, and I think the Prime Minister's goal is to bring it within the first 50 uh, as well. Uh, we have also, of course, seen, as you said, so much investment coming in into the country. We have seen um, you know, a lot of reforms in uh, the GST. Uh, in the uh, IBC, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code was passed, and these are all landmark uh, achievements. And uh, since 91, when we had our first wave of big reforms, this is the next bigger wave we've seen. Yet, of course, of course, we see, still see some challenges ahead on competitiveness, and uh, particularly on the banking sector, you know, top cost of capital and labor uh, issues as well. So uh, do you see this, the next five years will be very critical to tackle some of these, to propel us to that kind of nine, ten trillion dollar uh, goal that we have. How do you see these shrinking back? Well, uh, I think the last uh, five years have been transformational in the sense of what you mentioned, that uh, a very, very large number of initiatives were taken by the government to address and uh, correct the imbalances uh, in both uh, economic growth and development. And of course, uh, from that perspective, I think, as you mentioned, the uh, Goods and Services Tax uh, was uh, a very, very uh, great step forward because it made, made us a unified market. Right. Uh, there were some 17 different taxes that were being charged across the board. Today, we have one tax. It has increased tax revenue collection by about 67% since then. <coughs> and I think uh, clearly, um, Economy functions much better when you have much freer movement of goods and services uh, across the country. Uh, we also had, uh, as you mentioned, the insolvency and bankruptcy court, which is very important for bridging the uh, levels of non performing assets in the banking sector uh, and how to uh, ensure that uh, industries are given an exit policy in a time bound manner on the uh, large debt burden that they may carry, uh, how to reform the banking sector. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, the flagship program of the Government of India, the Make in India, Digital India, Smart Cities, <coughs> Swach Bharat Abhiyan, all of these uh, are, are uh, focus areas where government has been moving forward. I think what is important is that we need to continue the momentum and also bring in uh, reforms. I mean, these are, these are there in your book. Uh, these are probably areas that have to be considered. Um, and uh, this is something that is, uh, well, forward looking, but uh, clearly we have to continue the reform process uh, in areas that uh, we need in the capital markets, in the financing se sector, in the labor uh, policy with regard to uh, you know, banking itself, uh, you know, how do you uh, improve the banking sector, how do you make the public sector more, public sector banks more competitive. All of these are in the realm of improvement. But I think infrastructure development is also a very, very key priority. The government has already initiated the Delhi Mumbai Economic Corridor, you know, vast economic development across 1400 kilometers which envisages uh, high-speed uh, freight uh, corridors, uh, and ports, uh, smart cities along the way, uh, industrial development. So these, this is one aspect of it. But we are looking at a quadrilateral, which involves uh, linking all the major cities, 
uh, which involves uh, creating the infrastructure for these major cities, um, harnessing the financing, which is very important. I think the National Infrastructure Investment Fund has been quite successful in attracting investments not only within the country, but also uh, countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Singapore uh, have invested uh, significantly in the NIIS. And this is where I think economic mm -hmm. development can really be deployed. And we have to look at how uh, the, as your, as the publication envisages, how we can bring down the logistical costs, the costs of doing business in India, how we can establish uh, food supply chains, uh, the cold storage uh, aspects, uh, improve food processing. Uh, in general, I think make our economy much more competitive. So some total of what we are looking at in uh, terms of the uh, large ambit of, of uh, both uh, continuing what is what is there and in terms of what is uh, could be uh, you know further reforms within the economic uh, uh, sector in India mm -hmm. is something that is, is uh, critical to that process. So it's, it's, what I'm saying is that it's an ongoing uh, uh, process, uh, and I want to also highlight, if you permit me, I know that. Uh, how does it work, uh, you know, in terms of the development uh, for the benefit of the common man? Uh, we are talking about economic growth and development, but for the large bulk of people in India, how do these economic reforms, how does economic development impact on them? I want to give one small example of how it does. Um, under G Digital India, we have what is called the direct benefit scheme. As you know, there are some 412 different welfare schemes in India. Most of them are targeting the poorest and the most uh, uh, underprivileged sections of our population, which really uh, is the area that we should be focusing on. And uh, there were many schemes. The major one was the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Landless Employment Guarantee Scheme, under which uh, you could get 100 days of employment uh, in rural areas, and that was a guarantee that was almost a right uh, within, the, within the law. Uh, now, under these schemes, a huge amount of money was paid out to people. But unfortunately, because most of these people to whom these welfare schemes were directed, did not have uh, the uh, the possibility of opening a bank account because the documentation needed was too onerous. Yes. So what the, the government did was brought in what is called the Pradhan Mantri Dhan Dhan Yojana, yes. uh, which is a scheme which is called banking the unbankable. You use biometrics to open bank accounts for people. You don't ask for documents. Those accounts are open. And all the schemes of the government of India, the 412 different schemes, transfer money directly to your account. So what is the benefit of that? One is you knock out the middleman. Secondly, you knock out uh, diversion of money along the way. Thirdly, you knock off fake uh, you know, uh, holders. That means, in other words, uh, you might have 100 people working, but you might show it to 200 people. So there are, there are people on paper, but they don't, they're not actually working. But when you have a direct benefits transfer based on biometrics, you simply can't have the scheme. I believe 14 million false, uh, you know, let's say, uh, uh, people who are in these registered in the schemes were eliminated. Uh, a total of 85 billion dollars were, were transferred under these schemes to uh, the poorest section of the population. Yes. Uh, and uh, 318 million new accounts were op opened under the banking, the unbankable scheme. And most important is that you brought these people into the economy, into the monetary economy, which were never there. I mean, you, they had some cash, they spent it, but today they have savings in the bank. Yes. And you're bringing the, what is called the bottom of the pyramid into the mainstream economy. And I think that is, the impact that uh, government is making on the, not just the uh, upper echelon of people, but really uh, on the uh, bottom of the pyramid. No, you're absolutely right. The, the India that you and I grew up in college is totally transformed today. Let me turn a little bit to um, trade. You know, as you said, we are contributing 9 to 10 percent of global GDP, but our trade still is, has grown, but still remains quite small. And just as we were ready to sort of break out into the world, the world is turning more protectionist. So for a country like India, which is still at a very, uh, what I call a low middle income level of development, trade is going to be very important. Also with the US, you know, we have a trade of about 125, 27 billion, but we want to make, grow it to 500 billion. So how do you see uh, India uh, projecting itself to help the global trading order remain less protectionist, but also, and then encouraging more of this kind of bilateral trade arrangements, particularly in, in, in 
no position that you would be in the United States. Well, uh, certainly, I think uh, you know the uh, fact that uh, our exposure to global trade has been lower than what uh, you would expect uh, is, is a factor. Uh, but uh, in, in a certain sense, that has also helped us uh, because we are somewhat insulated from the, uh, let me say, uh, many of the uh, you know uh, financial crashes and economic uh, let's say uh, downturns that we've seen, uh, and uh, so uh, but of course uh, the endeavor should be to increase your uh, your uh, position in the global trading order uh, to export more uh, to be more integrated uh, uh, economically uh, in the international arena, and I think that is uh, what is uh, in many senses. Uh, uh, outlined both in your publication as well as in the Prime Minister's vision uh, when we talked about the fact that uh, one of the, we need to address the, the, the let's say, causes for uh, our not being able to trade to the extent possible. So one of the areas, of course, is to increase efficiency, uh, lower the costs of, uh, of production uh, by improving infrastructure, uh, by uh, improving the logistical uh, let's say, base on which we operate, uh, by ensuring that, uh, you know, the Factor costs uh, of uh, doing business, uh, you know, land, labor, uh, financial markets, and so on and so forth are reformed. Uh, also, institutional reforms, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the regulatory mechanism, uh, the uh, environment under which you do business, uh, simplification of rules and regulations, and so on and so forth. And I think uh, this is something that is certainly uh, on the cards. Uh, we are already doing it, and we will. I think. Uh, be looking at much more of this uh, in the next five to ten years to come. And of course, uh, if you look at the vast amount of, of initiatives that are already on way, uh, which are already ongoing, uh, it just needs a little more time to be able to come on scheme. Uh, if you look at the transportation sector alone, the sort of uh, revolutions in the uh, in the transport corridors that we are creating, as I said, not just Delhi, Mumbai but also Mumbai, Chennai, Chennai, Kolkata, Kolkata, Delhi, and then up to Amritsar. Uh, we're creating high-speed freight corridors. We're creating high-speed trains. Uh, there are 22 cities that are creating metros, uh, you know, underground metros uh, 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 projects. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at uh, a huge expansion in the highway sector in India. Uh, we are creating 27 kilometers of highways a day as we speak. Uh, all of this is work in progress, and I think uh, uh, you will have a situation, uh, you know, in the next uh, five years where the discernible change will be very, very uh, visible for all of us uh, to see. Uh, but I, I mean, I take your point that uh, that all of this has to lead up to uh, our being more competitive in the international market, uh, being able to provide uh, the necessary, uh, uh, let's say, uh, environment under which our businesses can uh, can uh, access the global market for better. And you mentioned the, the India-U.S. scenario. Uh, the United States is India's largest trade partner. Um, in the last year, we have jumped from 126 to 140 billion dollars in terms of bilateral trade. Um, India uh, sort of exports over 80 billion dollars to the United States, uh, and the U.S. exports to to India are increasing significantly. Uh, we saw an increase of close to 30 percent in U.S. exports last year. So bilateral trade has been increasing, and U.S. exports to India, as India's import exports to the United States, have also increased. And of course, at the rate we are going, uh, we should certainly envisage uh, a very strong uh, target. Uh, I know industry has put a $500 billion target, and I think uh, government has to do all it can to facilitate uh, uh, that uh, particular goal. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think, um, you know, we, as you said, we are, we have a lot of young people. We are a very young country. We have a lot of very young people. We are going to have the world's largest educational system. We have healthcare needs for all these people. We have huge infrastructure needs. We have also, um, you know, our agriculture sector needs modernization. The United States, of course, helped us with the first green revolution. So we need another green revolution in India. So how do you see, um, you know, uh, especially in higher education, where the United States is a great leader, healthcare, in infrastructure, Defense-related industries. How do you see U.S. businesses coming to India, and what can be done to encourage and enhance this? Well, you raised uh, demographics, and I want to dwell on that briefly. 
because when you look at India, it is not just a market of 1.3 billion people. It's a very strong middle class yes. uh, and growing purchasing power, but it's also the demographic trend that's important. Yes. Uh, your publication outlined that uh, the average age in India by the year 2030 will be 28.2 years. Yes. Uh, in comparison, the average age in the United States will be 35 years and China, 35 years. Uh, European Union will be 40 years and Japan will be 42 or 43 years. So India has the enviable uh, situation of being having the largest workforce by the year, I think uh, 2022 or 23, we're gonna have the largest workforce, which is um, uh, about 900 million people. Uh, the ages are between 15 and 65. Uh, this is a great opportunity because uh, you have a younger productive force uh, supporting a smaller uh, aging population. But at the same time, it's a challenge because as I said, you're bringing in one million people into the uh, economy every month, not every year, but every month. How do you train those people? How do you skill those people? How do you ensure that they have, uh, they are employable uh, and uh, bring them into uh, the digital age in which they can contribute uh, in ways that are uh, meaningful? Uh, so demographics is very important in everything that we, we say and do. Uh, of course, when you come down to uh, what you mentioned about the Green Revolution, I think uh, the Green Revolution in India was uh, the first step in which we achieved agricultural self-sufficiency, food self-sufficiency. Uh, that food security in India was a very, very important part of food security on the global scale, considering that we account for one-sixth of the world's population. Uh, but the, the Green Revolution also owes a lot to people like Dr. Martin Bollock from the United States who contributed uh, to the success of agriculture. And today, with an agricultural production of over 200,000 tons, uh, we have food self-sufficiency. <coughs> but we are looking for a, a second Green Revolution, as you said, our Prime Minister calls it a rainbow revolution, because he talks about green, blue, and white, as in agriculture, as in marine, and as in, uh, as in uh, milk uh, production. And uh, we are looking really at the Gangetic uh, Valley, areas that were missed out in the first Green Revolution. The first Green Revolution focused on North India and parts of South, but we, had, we didn't uh, really focus on the Gangetic Valley, which is really uh, the most fertile part of India, but which is where the potential for the second Green Revolution lies. And obviously, technology is a very important part of that. Uh, uh, we look to the United States uh, for, uh, for technology. The United States is a front of cutting edge technology. And certainly, uh, agricultural technologies with, which are relevant, which are appropriate, are those that we will be seeking from uh, our international partners, including the United States. So, um, uh, Ambassador, you, you know, you, we, you have a large Indian diaspora in the United States also. They have been here, they have uh, contributed to the United States in huge ways. They have also contributed to closer ties and links between India and the United States, and how do you see this as a potential, or, uh, or it's, it's there and it's uh, to, be, to be nurtured and you know, it doesn't need to be directed in any particular way, but uh, you know, this is a, this is, the Indian diaspora is obviously in the United States uh, a very positive development for closer cultural, economic, and other ties with <coughs> Just wanted to see your reaction from the view. Well, that's a, that's a very important uh, point. I think the Indian diaspora in the United States is about four million people. Yes. Um, they uh, clearly uh, are a very successful entrepreneurial uh, professional community. Yes. Uh, their uh, let's say um, upward mobility in the United States uh, has been uh, a great uh, source of inspiration to all of us uh, in India. As someone who represents India in the United States, I see the Indian community as a great uh, source of strength and support for us in, the, in our endeavors to strengthen ties with the United States. Yes. Now, when you look at uh, the economic field, you've got uh, uh, a very large number of, of uh, American Indians who have been very successful. I went the other day to San Francisco and I was able to meet uh, a very good number of, of uh, people from the Indian American community who are venture capitalists, yes. who are in the high technology sector, uh, who have been extremely successful in the fields that they have uh, participated and contributed to in the U.S. and internationally. And here are people who are saying that, look, uh, how can I help strengthen that relationship? What can I do uh, to, to <coughs> increase the economic uh, uh, relationship between India, India and the United States? And, and I think uh, all you need to do is to channelize those uh, uh, 
uh, that want to put it into uh, something that is concrete and meaningful. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we are also uh, looking at technology. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, the Indian community has contributed through uh, technology. Let me just say that some of our finest minds are here in the United States. Some of the people who represent, uh, you know, the best in education, uh, the best in terms of uh, experience, expertise have, have come to the United States. And here are people who, after being successful, are looking to see what they can do to bridge the gap. And that gap is not just in terms of industry, not just in terms of investment, not just in terms of bringing technology, but also sharing your knowledge and expertise. We have a program uh, called Yarn, under which we invite people who have, who have certain uh, experience and expertise in their different fields. Could be uh, molecular biology, it could be uh, physics, it could be uh, some different area to come and teach in the Indian university. So this program links you up and your expertise with the areas where this, the this expertise required in India. And we have uh, in our own mission, uh, uh, you know, science and technology wing, uh, which is uh, happy to link up people in, in, in this manner. And we have, I mean, there are, there are some 1,500 people who have come down and talked in Indian universities, taken courses, seminars, modules, and shared the experience and expertise with, uh, with uh, those uh, in India. So this is the sort of, uh, you know, linkage. But at the end of the day, uh, they also represent a huge uh, reservoir of goodwill uh, for us. Uh, they are uh, politically, uh, I think, uh, more involved today uh, in, in uh, the United States as US citizens. Uh, they are contributing to the political process. We are happy to see several um, Indian Americans in the Congress. Um, I went to uh, some state uh, assemblies and I see that uh, you have Indian Americans in state assemblies also. So there is a great deal of appreciation, not just for their participation, but contribution to this political process in the United States, which is really an area of commonality between us because we have the same, we share the same uh, values, the same principles, the same uh, political, uh, let's say, ideologies in terms of democracy and, and all that. So it is natural that Indians would participate actively in political that the two world's largest democracies they would be. But, um, you know, um, you have had, uh, as Maggie also told us, such a distinguished career, and now you are in this very pivotal position for India, but also for India-US relations. So how do you, Your Excellency, see your time here? What are your, what are your targets, your goals, or anything you wish to share with us? Well, in the, uh, you know, uh, with more than two months that I've been there, uh, the one thing that has struck me is uh, the level of importance uh, that uh, people in the United States attach to relations with India. I'm not talking just about the administration, but also at, on, on the Hill, in the media, academia, uh, businesses. Um, I think there is uh, one factor which is common is that uh, everybody attaches value to that relation. And this has also helped me because it has given me access to people, it has given me uh, an open door entry into, into uh, many areas that would be inaccessible to, uh, to those who uh, are new to the United States. And I think uh, we have to build on this, uh, on this uh, let's say, uh, goodwill on the situation that we find ourselves in uh, to take the relationship forward. And from my point of view, I think there are two or three areas that I identified as being broadly uh, those uh, in which we could, uh, I think, work. One, of course, is to see how we can take forward our common convergences on the strategic uh, aspects of the relationship and leverage that into finding synergies uh, that can uh, provide a, a roadmap or blueprint uh, to take our two countries forward over the next, uh, not just a few years, but over the next uh, 50 years. The second, of course, is, uh, as I said, an economic, uh, in the realm of economic affairs, which is basically uh, attracting finance, uh, capital, and technology into India. Uh, the U.S. is uh, the, the number one, you know, economic superpower. It has uh, both the capital as well as the technology to be able to make a qualitative uh, difference in the way India's economic growth and development profile is emerging. Uh, and the third aspect, of course, is the people-to-people -people relationship. Uh, again, uh, you take into account the values and principles that we share. Uh, and you try to uh, give that uh, certain areas of concrete shape, uh, which is also manifested, as said, by the Indian American <coughs> community here, who are ambassadors of India in the United States and 
vice versa. And how we can take that and, and uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, increase the sort of uh, both understanding and, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, convert that uh, goodwill into something which is, which is uh, you know, manifested in um, areas of support for our relationship is something that I think we need to work on. So broadly, these are the three areas that uh, I propose to focus on. Of course, uh, in doing that, uh, there are many other aspects that could come up, and we need all the help that we can get. Uh, but I think, as I said, we, we already have a great deal of positive goodwill, and we just need to keep that uh, momentum going forward. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I mean, you have uh, given us such a, a comprehensive picture about India, India-US relations. We are all behind you. Success to you. We wish you uh, the very best in your this very critical assignment and any help you need from us, we are available to you anytime. I must say, you have been able to explain this report better than I could have. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I must, I'm must. i very grateful to you for that as well. And uh, thank you so much for coming here, for uh, giving us your, your very uh, you know, open and very uh, frank views on, on, on the situation. Yes, and thank you. So. Thank you for having me here. And thank, thank the Elliott School for, of International Relations for, for hosting us. And of course, for everybody who's shown an interest in India and US relationships. I may take just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you had a wonderful session. I very much apologize for being late. I was called uh, duties elsewhere. Uh, but I very much wanted to be here. Uh, India, obviously, the oldest or the largest democracy in the world, in close partnership with the oldest constitutional democracy in the world. Obviously, one of the most important countries in what is clearly one of the most dynamic regions on the planet. Uh, this is a, a critically important time for us to talk <coughs> much more about the U.S. Bilateral relationship. Your Excellency, you're most welcome. And I very much hope to see you here and colleagues hope you have long to be able to go to school. So, welcome. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.
experts from the sector that I want to talk about today, one being higher education by Adrian, uh, Sophia would be talking about Lupin, and Dr. Subir Bokran would be talking about investment in infrastructure. But let me just give a quick introduction for all the panelists sitting on stage with me. On my left is Dr. Subir Bokran. He's the Executive Director for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Sri Lanka at the International Monetary Fund. Before this, he was um, at the Brookings Institute in India. And before that, he was also the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India from 2009 to 2012. Further on my left is Sophia Mumtaz. She's the president of Lupin Pharmaceuticals uh, and serves as the head for pipeline management and legal at Lupin Limited. Um, we are going to engage in a interesting, if I can use that word, conversation with Sophia on the role that pharmaceuticals play in India US trade. Very important. And on my extreme left is Adrian. He heads an interesting consultancy called Stanham S4, which almost serves as a conduit between trade organizations and private sector companies, both India, US, India, UK, um, and a few other countries if I'm not wrong, Adrian. I'll be free to sort of elaborate more on when, when you talk. But I want to start by talking to Dr. Gorkhan about how infrastructure investment, I mean, you all have been hearing a lot about US trying to focus a lot on rebuilding its infrastructure in the US. Uh, countries like India and other Asian countries are also putting a lot of money and investment in, in, in infrastructure in their respective geographies and going beyond as well from their own respective geographies. I want to understand from Dr. Gokran, what's the history or the evolution of infrastructure investment in India when did the government take cognizance of this and where, where are we on infrastructure investment right now? Okay, thank, well, firstly, thank you, Rudika, for inviting me. Thank you, Ajay and uh, Kiki, for organizing this event. Uh, let me provide a sort of historical perspective and then use that as a context for talking about current infrastructure policy or challenges. Uh, We've had really four phases, and I think every country would have gone through these phases, uh, you know, for perhaps with varying periods of time, but essentially the same pattern. Uh, from the 50s to the early 90s, it was the first P, which was just public. Infrastructure was assumed to be a government responsibility, a state responsibility. Uh, and we did obviously put in, put up a fair amount of infrastructure, our power sector, road expansion, port development, all these things happened with public funding, uh, with no real uh, recognition of the opportunity or potential for private investment, partly because we didn't have the kind of private sector capabilities that 
might have been needed to execute the strategy. In the early 90s, as we liberalized, uh, the pendulum swung to the other fee, which was, okay, so you know, let the private sector handle it. This will allow us to uh, focus the fiscal, uh, sort of, or, or refocus the fiscal sector on social development, on, on welfare, and so on. And uh, so, you know, let private investment develop infrastructure. Now, that proved to be a difficult challenge for the private sector to deal with for a variety of reasons. Uh, but we had one outstanding success out of that experiment, which was the telecom sector. And I think the important thing to recognize is that you know, when, you, when you open up private sector development, some sectors are more amenable to this strategy than others. Why did the telecom sector succeed? I think that's an important lesson to learn. Uh, most people would say because it was subject to a single regulatory jurisdiction, because it did not get into conflicts with the territories, with, with state level uh, regulators and local regulators, which are very important in real estate driven or land driven infrastructure projects, roads, electricity, power plants, and so on. So we had this success, but other sectors really did not find an opportunity to take advantage of this. So then we moved to the PP, uh, the public-private. This was in the early 2000s. Uh, and I think that came on the back of reasonable success, or perhaps great success, with the first P in the highway program. The highway program, uh, the National Highway Development Program, which was launched in 2001, 2002, uh, showed that you could have public funding with private execution working reasonably well, and we did end up building a lot of new road capacity over, the, over that period, which has picked up again in the last few years. So there, a sort of PP framework emerged, you know, what can the public sector do, what can the private sector do? Uh, so that's what formalizes the public-private partnership framework. Uh, and there, we started to run into other kinds of issues. Uh, so now we're moving to what I would call the FPPP which is uh, not the first past the post, which is which is used to characterize electoral systems, but first public, then private. Uh, and I think the reason for this, the context in which this strategy emerged, is basically because in the PP framework, the public-private partnership framework, uh, it became quite obvious that both sides are incapable of fully meeting the responsibilities uh, in a way which allowed projects to become viable. Uh, the risk-taking was entirely on the private sector. And as we see from the impact it had on the financial sector, this was not a capacity the private sector had. It just could not take on the risk, particularly if it was borrowing to finance infrastructure. Uh, but there were no other channels of funding at that time. Uh, the government should have perhaps provided a much higher degree of coordination between national objectives, priorities, instruments, state level concerns, jurisdictions, and local, particularly I think local government became a very, or local, let's say political economy, became a very important factor in influencing the execution of power plants, roads because of land acquisition, ports, and so on. And so a lot of these projects became very enmeshed in delays because authorities were not coordinating enough, and that led to much greater burden on the uh, on the private financing, uh, which resulted in non-performing loans uh, sort of burgeoning. So about half the non-performing loans in the banking sector are infrastructure projects, uh, which, which is an issue which we could perhaps get into in, in, in the Q&A. So what does this lead to in terms of learning and, and uh, reorientation? The ambassador mentioned the National in Infrastructure Investment Fund. Uh, I was a strong proponent of this model in my commentary on infrastructure uh, as this government was putting this policy into place. I think this really captures the need to de-risk the executor, the, the, the project execution phase from financial risk. And the way it's doing this is by creating portfolios of infrastructure projects. Uh, when you look at the NIF as a structure, it's, it's it was actually started operations in 2016 and starting to, to deploy funds now. But it was able to attract uh, exactly the kind of investment you need in infrastructure, which is long-term, safe return kind of 
through uh, investment uh, objectives, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, all these channels are looking for very long-term horizons with relatively predictable uh, returns along the way, very little risk. And infrastructure offers that. We've seen that in the utility space in this country and in others. Uh, and what NIF did was to allow this kind of money to be pooled, uh, not to be exposed to individual project risk, so you can pool it into a sector portfolio, you can pool it into a, a fund of funds kind of model which has exposure to different kinds of sectors. And because you're de-risking the investor, uh, you're actually allowing or making it much more attractive for a wider range of investors to come in. So I think that ability to raise money is uh, something that's been proven and that addresses the risk part. Uh, what remains, uh, one is that we have a lot of stalled firms. Uh, these are, we have you know, more power capacity, generating capacity now than we're going to need for the next 15 or 20 years. Uh, but these are not operational for a variety of reasons and part of it is financial, part of it is the fact that they are non-performing assets, they cannot continue to do business. So we need to find a way to translate this funding attractiveness into resurrecting what are essentially some projects. They're not, they're not bad projects, they just haven't been able to get started. Uh, so moving money into reviving stalled projects, which will allow them to become, uh, sort of contribute as well as become viable. Uh, and the third element is this greater coordination between national, state, and local authorities which actually uh, is very much needed to facilitate the reactivation of these projects and also the new ones. Uh, I think the recommendation in uh, the, the, the volume about uh, a single infrastructure ministry is an attractive one. Uh, it may not ever materialize, but I think the idea is very sound, which is that infrastructure is very much of a network. Uh, the, 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 Productivity of some projects depends heavily on the productivity of others in, uh, in the neighborhood or even in the wider system. So when you start to look at infrastructure strategy, you have to understand and, and leverage the, uh, the interrelationships between them. So if you build a port, but you haven't built a railway or a road line that connects it, the effectiveness of the port is, is hugely diluted. Uh, if you build a road which leads nowhere, uh, you, know, you know what that means. I think this idea of interlinkage, interdependency is something that's critical to rolling out the strategy to both get the maximum impact of investment and also to minimize the financial risk from exposure to individual projects. I think that's the way in which this, uh, this strategy is rolling out uh, and you know, there are obviously difficulties and challenges as we go along, but uh, I think once we have the vision, we have the strategy to start to translate that into instruments, uh, that's the way I see this progressing. I just want to you know, relate uh, or link back to another thing the ambassador said about GST. We build highways which allow you to increase your vehicle speed from you know, an average of 25 kilometers an hour to 50, 60 kilometers an hour. But then the vehicle goes and stops at a state border. So you've reduced it back to 25 kilometers an hour because of the time it takes. You, know, you have a whole bunch of vehicles that come and stop there. So what the GST does, apart from of this sort of abstract notion of unified market, is to allow your infrastructure to be that much more productive because you're then using the 60 kilometer or 70 kilometer, doesn't sound much in the US, I know, but in India, 60, 70 kilometers is a lot, uh, to allow the whole, the car to move at 60 kilometers an hour right through its entire journey. And that's something which will, is a phenomenal, I think, addition to, uh, to productivity as we go along. So, you can start to see how you know, intricately infrastructure is plugged into so many other initiatives and how they all sort of leverage off each other to, to add to growth potential, to productivity, to a whole bunch of other desirable purposes. Mm -hmm. I just want to continue this conversation, so which is why I just want to put a question before I go to the next uh, uh, panelist. Do, do you think that infrastructure investments by a government or a public sector company has an impact on the bank balance of the government? And if yes, then where do you see the insolvency and bankruptcy code uh, being part of this whole conversation in infrastructure investment? I think uh, the bankruptcy framework has to uh, do two things, and it's a difficult balance, but I think it's, it's important in our context. 
One is to differentiate between bankruptcy in the classical business sense, a bad business model, a badly run company, uh, but a company that has assets that have can easily be restored. So for example, most of the revolution, high profile revolution uh, events we've seen in the last few months are steel. So what you're saying is inefficiently run steel companies being taken over by efficiently run steel companies and you know, that's adding pr productivity, capacity and so on. Uh, infrastructure, as we see it now, power plants, ports and so on, don't have that resaleability because there isn't anybody there who's saying, look, here's a product that's stalled for a bunch of external factors. It hasn't started production yet. It's not generating any cash. Uh, we can't take it with us. I mean, who's, who's on the other side of the, of, the, of the market? So I think we have to look at this feature, this, this sort of distinctive feature of infrastructure projects, infrastructure non-performing loans, and find a way to reconcile this uh, with the overall bankruptcy process. So I think the NII, which uh, the finance minister, Ms. Jetley, once described as asset recycling, which is essentially you take over these assets, you find a way to transfer the ownership from the bank balance sheet to the, or the, 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 the financial implications of the bank balance sheet to another balance sheet. Uh, it's kind of a bad bank, you will, but not really bad because these are fundamentally good projects. Uh, and then as they come closer to, to delivering uh, revenue, uh, start to look for other investors who could come in. So I think that's a financial engineering challenge which the NIF should be uh, starting to take on as it, as, it, as it sort of gains experience, builds relationships with investors, and starts to understand the uh, the intricacies of the, how do you transfer these assets and you know make them viable. But I don't think there's any infrastructure asset that doesn't have potential. It's India is a complete seller's market when it comes to infrastructure. Every product has potential. Question is how do you get it out of its current sort of constraints and put it on that uh, viability track. Thank you, Dr. Bokran. I wanna I wanna now bring in uh, Sophia and and I'll keep keep questions after the after we're done with the demo. So keep your questions for Dr. Bokran ready. Um, Sophia, when we talk about India US trade, most of the times people have very old dated talking points and pharmaceutical comes at the top of the conversation and the assumption and the cloud is that India is very protectionist on pharma and drug making, but very few people know the kind of role <clears throat> Indian generic pharma plays in healthcare system in the US. Could you spend five, seven minutes talking to us in the audience on what what's the role of the Indian pharma? So, you know, and this is my personal view, I think India, um, in Indian pharmaceutical industry is really the pharmacy of the world. Um, we provide, in the generic space, you know, uh, as all of you know, 90% of the prescription dispensed in the U.S. are generic. And the cost of the healthcare system is only 23%. Um, Indian pharmaceutical industry provides 40% of that, um, that generic script which is dispensed in the U.S. Uh, I have a little dated information, but in 2017 alone, uh, generic pharmaceutical industry saved about 270 million in healthcare costs in the US. In the US. Um, billion. Sorry, yeah, billion. <laughs> 270 billion in healthcare costs. And 40% of that came from Indian generic industry. Uh, so that's in US alone. In, um, in UK, about 25% of the prescriptions are dispensed, uh, that are dispensed are uh, manufactured in India. 80% of antiretroviral drugs, which are used to treat um, uh, <coughs> AIDS, are uh, manufactured out of India globally. 50% uh, of the vaccines uh, globally are manufactured in India. So India is really um, uh, at the leading edge, so to say, of uh, generic pharmaceutical products globally. Sorry, um, Lupin, and I'll just do a plug to Lupin now. Uh, we are one of the top um, five um, generic pharmaceuticals um, out of India, one of the top 10 globally. And uh, we, we supply about 6% of the US um, market of generic pharmaceutical products here. Um, and by the way, the 
average copay for a generic pharmaceutical product in the US was $6. Compare that to the average copay for a branded product, which could be you know, upwards of $50. Uh, so, um, so to say the least, um, you know, in terms of trade, um, we are about, I think, um, if I'm not wrong, about 50 billion, 55 billion by 2020, out of India. <clears throat> so then, if these are the statistics that you've given that it helps US to save so much money on healthcare, and 40% of the generic pharma in the US is provided and supplied by the Indian generic pharma companies in the US, if, if I'm not wrong, <coughs> why do you think there is so much of negativity and perception around Indian pharma? And many times we see that people tend to believe that the quality of pharmaceutical produced in India is much less than the quality produced elsewhere. Where do you think this is coming from? Very good question, and I don't know. <laughs> you know, obviously there is, uh, there is a lot of noise which talks about uh, the quality of products coming out of India. And part of it could be that we provide such a huge volume. You know, there are over 500 manufacturing sites in India. Now, there are issues. I won't deny there are issues with Indian manufacturing sites. There are issues with manufacturing sites outside of India. It's just that there are so many in India that they get highlighted a lot. You know, I can talk about um, issues um, of manufacturing in India, in US, in uh, in Europe, in in um, Canada. You know, FDA. You know, luckily for for America, FDA is a very very diligent organization. It is very, very, you know, it has a very robust way of auditing and monitoring uh, manufacturing sites across the world. Um, it is our job as pharmaceutical companies to keep um, increasing our level of compliance with the increasing level of scrutiny, which comes, you know, with, with these. FDA has an office in India, you know. It has an uh, inspector who was stationed there, you know, through the year, we get um, audit at any one of our manufacturing sites at least once a month. So FDA is doing a very good job of monitoring and auditing the quality of drugs coming out of India. So to say that Indian manufacturers are not producing quality products is absolutely wrong because FDA would not allow them to bring those products to 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 US. Um, now, where does that noise come from? That's a very good question. You know, obviously there are many. Um, how can I say, uh, many, many organizations would not want, you know, brand companies, for example, may not want uh, too much genericization, you know. That's a good point. I might, in fact, good way to segue into where do you think the brand pharma versus genetic pharma stands in the U.S. and in India, or, or in the U.S. and outside of the U.S.? Do you think that the brand pharma here in the U.S. has a much more market uh, market access than, than generic pharma? Um, they definitely have more money. So, and therefore more lobbying power. But having said that, you know, there is definitely a public interest, mm. right? Uh, which generic pharma fulfills. Mm. So I think we have, how shall I say, we have the good on our side. Mm. We may not have that much money to lobby. Mm. Uh, so I think um, everybody sees that generic pharma brings value to the uh, pharma, to the overall healthcare cost. That's become such a huge issue now. And to put it in perspective, if you look at biologics, only two percent of the patients take biologic medication, but that accounts for forty percent of the healthcare cost. So once and you know there are not many. There's only one or two. Um, biologic products for which there are substitutable generic biosimilar products, right? Now, Lupin as an organization has taken that decision that we're going to start developing biosimilars. We're going to file a few this year. But till we have a healthy uh, biosimilars or a generic to, uh, to biologic, you know, this healthcare cost is not coming down. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I have more questions once I open it up. Um, Adrian, you run a very successful India-US education and knowledge exchange program. Um, when we talk about higher education or education, most of the times the countries would look at it as soft diplomacy. Talk to us about why are we making the point that it is a 
very important trade component. And if I can take the liberty of putting it as it is, also profitability. So why did we miss that? And what have you observed in that sector? Well, firstly, thank you for having me, uh, Ridiko, and uh, Elliot School uh, for hosting us today. So prior to moving to Washington DC three years ago, uh, I was based in India, I lived in New Delhi and, and was uh, building and running this business. And a big part of our growth, as you said, was higher education. And we now manage upwards of 100 higher education institutions supporting their activities on the ground in India. And many people think, well, that's about the student recruitment agenda, which I'll come on to talk about. But 12 of the top 20 universities in the world use us to administer billions of dollars of research funding, uh, which contribute to, to some of India's key strategic development goals. And if you break it down and look at the activity that we're supporting at the universities, are uh, the, the activities they're embarking on, the student recruitment and mobility <coughs> is, a, is a big deal. Uh, in the US alone, India contributes $7.5 billion towards the US economy, and that's considered an export of service. It's essentially America selling its expertise to India. Uh, recent studies have demonstrated that that contributes to 95,000 jobs here in the US directly. And those two statistics are direct contributors. They're without the parents coming over, the tourism, the investment in businesses, property and real estate that Indian families then buy on the back of that. So that is a significant contribution in its own, own right. And US institutions, like many others around the world, have suffered from withdrawal of funding from the state <coughs> or uh, from, from the federal level. And what's happened over the last five to 10 years is income from Indian students and Chinese and others has contributed towards that shortfall and enable those institutions to continue to hire the brightest academic minds, to invest in great facilities, and that's just purely the kind of direct uh, impact. Then we started to look at where these Indian students were coming from, where they were going to, and then it's, it's very regularly uh, featured in Indian US discussions, and the ambassador touched on this, but if you look at the brain power behind some of the US's most valuable companies, Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google, Thomas Kurian, who's now the CEO of Google Cloud, one of its fastest growing business units, Indra Noye, of course, at Pepsi, uh, and, and many and others. Mastercard. Yes, Mastercard, um, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And these have become serious wealth creators for the United States and serious job creators for the United States. And that all stems from a funnel of, of student recruitment, which then uh, builds out into economic prosperity. And I think you know, that, that is often dismissed, partly because institutions don't like seeing student recruitment as a money-making exercise. That's not how it's discussed. I moved over here three years ago, and I was struck by the lack of structured discussion on higher education linkages between the US and India. Uh, I was involved with the embassy and, and people like Stout and many other uh, of the trade agencies here that focus on India in the defense area, in pharmaceuticals, in agriculture, but no one was talking about higher education and there's been no formal dialogue in this country or in India between the two governments on higher education since 2014. Yet it's one of the key ties that stems into all of the avenues that we've, we've been discussing, whether it be government, business, academia. So we launched, as you suggested, with great support from colleagues here at the Indian Embassy, something called the US Indian Knowledge Exchange last year, which is to unpick what these activities look like and how both governments can then play a supporting role. So you have, first and foremost, the direct impact of student recruitment and where those bright minds then go on. But you have the research contribution and we alone manage upwards of a quarter of a billion dollars of research that the likes of Stanford and Harvard and MIT and Cornell and UC Berkeley are being paid by various sources, could be World Bank funds, could be uh, large foundations in India, could be the Gates Foundation, could be philanthropists, could be local states in India, and they're being funded to bring their expertise to India to work on key areas. And then I started to look in more detail at what these areas were, and you realize that they're around basic agricultural improve, efficiency improvement, 
healthcare, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, um, gender issues, water, environment, artificial intelligence, and you realize the significant contribution that, then in, that US institutions are making to these key basic principles that India is really grappling with at the moment. And you realize then the impediments that those US institutions have and how much opportunity there is to unlock it. Then I took a step back and I looked at campaigns like the Make in India campaign, the Digital India campaign, Skill India campaign, and I realized what was happening, and, and this I think has still got a lot of discussion to have both here in DC and in Delhi, is that I think those policies, although I'm a great advocate for what is being done, are fundamentally flawed unless India owns the intellectual property for those campaigns. So Make in India is, is, is a great opportunity to bring investment in and create jobs, which I know is a number one priority for the Indian government. But ultimately, if India doesn't own that intellectual property, the wealth will either come back to the US or it will go off to Japan or it goes to Europe or wherever. So what we've been working on over the last two to three years is plugging uh, US academic ties into the Make in India campaign and ensuring that the value creation of those Make in India products, of the Digital India products, is captured in India by Indian-owned stakeholders. Because if that happens, then the likelihood of these jobs to move to Africa or to other parts of Asia in the future is going to be significantly reduced. So that's an area that we're um, very actively working on and we see as a priority. And then the third area is the role that academia plays in industry. And in my view, having spent the last 26 plus years of my life working in and with India, is that there's significant leverage that can be gained by the very, very bright minds that India clearly possesses and plugging that into industry in India and helping create some of this intellectual property domestically. And in reverse, industry going back into the academic sector in India and saying, hey, look, this is what we need. We need job-ready people that have got these skills. We need people that have got this outlook on life. How do, you, how do we work together? And that's in its infancy at the moment. And I think there's a lot of lessons, there are a lot of lessons that the US has learned, both positive and, and bumps along the way that can transfer into the Indian context to help India uh, develop its own story. So, uh, briefly and concisely, if you can say, I mean, I just heard you say that the US has now started taking cognizance of how they need to connect more with the Indian students and academia and universities. Tell me one thing that the US government or the policymakers in the US need to know or do in the coming six months or one year time period that how can they attract more Indian students to the US? I think there needs to be consistency across the agencies of, of the strategy. You know, on, on one hand, if you've got one agency saying we want students, we want students, we want students, and on the other on the other stance, an agency calls a stunt by creating a fake university to lure Indian students in, and then the whole sector kind of gets this fear, and the State Department say, well, we didn't know it was happening. You're not really you're not really helping the, the, the agenda. It's a clear political stance in the US that the, the dominance of Chinese students coming here is something that the US wants more balance on. I didn't say that either. I, I said that, you know, you, 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 it, it's the, you know this, is, this is widely debated on the Hill. And India's a natural foil to that dominance. And it's a foil that has benefit. The Chinese students go back home and you never see them again. They don't contribute as much, anywhere near as much to the ongoing success of the US economy. And I think the demand from Indian students for US higher education is, is unlimited virtually. But if the policies are not consistent, if the messaging in particular is not consistent, <coughs> clear, and positive towards attracting those students, you're gonna make it very difficult. So I think, you know, at the highest levels downwards, the US government needs to make a start to say, this, as by the way, the Australians have done, the Canadians have done, the Brits have messed around, so I won't defend my own country in this, <laughs> this particular case. But make a clear statement from the top and say, actually, we want you here as part of a wider strategic, economic and academic policy. <coughs> if that's the view, say it, and, and you will find that the, the lever moves considerably. So I would at this point plug in that we as a trade organization are working with a lot of 
law makers in the US to try and help them figure out how they can attract more younger students into the US, working with the embassies, even on other folks in India. Um, I now <clears throat> want to open uh, the floor for questions from the panelists if anybody has. Please raise your hand and somebody can. <laughs> yes, I came to answer questions, but now I've seen this beautiful discussion, I feel like asking questions. <laughs> so excuse me. Uh, I have two short questions. Uh, uh, one question is for Sophia and one is for Adrian. Uh, Sophia, you talked beautifully about uh, what the generics can do and how they are contributing to the U.S. healthcare and the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, India is one of the oldest civilizations, and it has a very rich system of indigenous medicines, and which has evolved over centuries and centuries. Uh, it is a knowledge which we should be sharing with the whole world. Uh, yoga, as you know, is now international. But the indigenous medicines seem to uh, fall behind, the lag far behind. Uh, as an expert in this area, uh, what do you think uh, should be done to create an ecosystem, both in India and in the US, which can make indigenous medicines so, um, you know, that's, um, that's a good question. The problem with indigenous, indigenous medicine is that it's um, herbal. A lot of it is herbal, which is a good thing. But the challenge that presents is the guidelines here in, in uh, most advanced markets, you know, including America, are, um, are so stringent that you need to define each and every element that goes into you know, that medication. So if it's a plant extract, you will have to tell exactly what is in that extract. That's a really challenging task. Um, so, and then you will have to show the clinical efficacy. So the cost of bringing those products to a country like America becomes uh, exorbitant with, you know, just from a purely um, business standpoint, um, the cost is so much that we're not sure if there's a commensurate return or not. Uh, in some other countries of the world, it's easier. Um, in America, it's, it's, uh, it's slightly more challenging. Any more questions? Uh, and thanks very much uh, you know, to the panelists. Actually, very, very stimulating points. I have a specific uh, question and a comment for Dr. Brokham. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful overview of the infrastructure issue. Um, you know, in terms of the financing needs, one is looking at over, say, the next 10 years or 15 years or so, it's going to be trillions of dollars. Uh, there is a lot of interest in investing in infrastructure from overseas investors. And you know, similar magnitudes, trillions of dollars of savings, if you take the Canadian pension funds and the US pension fund, are interested in and willing to, are able to invest in India. And our own companies, we've talked in the CBTQ, we've already uh, made significant uh, investments. One of the issues which comes up is the transparency and the consistency of the regulatory issue. You know, the economic and financial risks companies, foreign investors, uh, applies to domestic companies also, can take. But the risk relating to changes in the regulatory environment, they, they are, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, quite often important stumbling blocks. Could you say a few words about uh, how uh, you know, India views the sort of changes which have been made in the past to improve that, and what more could be done? Thank you. Um, do you mind if I take one more question? Sure. Um, the lady sitting behind, Good morning. I have a question targeted to Dr. Bhokran as well. And uh, that is, in India, we have 56% of the rural population that is landless. As India is going to grow its infrastructure and you know develop, how, uh, do, how does our growth strategy incorporate people who typically get left behind, like the landless? Thank you. And uh, the gentleman here, if you could put a question directly to Sure. No, I I think I can do that because it's slightly related to what the lady out there said, uh, directly abused to Dr. Bokum. I, I, I work with some SMEs in India, especially in agriculture, helping them raise uh, capital from here. 
Uh, when we speak of our infrastructure, typically we speak of the ports and the roads and the large ticket size infrastructure, but when even in the case of agriculture, there is huge funding requirement which has a risk profile similar to infrastructure projects. Long gestation period, high transaction cost for smallholders, which leaves the near farm infrastructure, you know, abandoned. It doesn't really attract uh, capital to that extent. There are some impact funds. I work with the World Bank. They, yeah, there's some grant money that's going in, but when it comes to uh, financing near farm grading sorting infrastructure, for example, it's small ticket size, maybe 20 lakhs for one farmer producer company, but 300,000 of those. And you know, so what, what would you say is the best way, regulatory wise and otherwise, and therefore relates to the Landis uh, farmer's question, to get finance into this sector, which, which really has a similar risk return profile? But it's not last ticket. Uh, we each had one question as well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Adrian, uh, you were excellent in the way uh, you advocated and you gave your thoughts. Uh, you know, recently the news headlines had this Farmington University, and you're aware of it. And uh, you know, back home. Uh, in India, we used to have a criminal justice system where cops don't induce anybody to commit a crime. They, they step in when a crime is committed. Uh, so I just wanted your thoughts on, uh, you know, and your help as well, on how we can prevent such things in the future and the impact incidents like this have on the entire ecosystem. But I, yeah, thank you for those questions. Uh, Manmohan, I think the solution that this document provides is one potential response to what you're saying, which is the reason why you have regulatory uncertainty and unpredictability is because you have multiple jurisdictions and multiple authorities. Now, as I said, it may not be realistic to expect this kind of concentration because there are so many stakes, so many vested interests in this sector. But I think the degree of coordination that you can aspire to realistically, even if you have multiple jurisdictions, uh, is something that certainly you know is very much part of the thinking. It's you know you, you can't just solve the finance problem and expect the momentum to continue because you have these other binding constraints. Uh, so at the central level, if you look at the policy level, uh, I think it's a matter of simply having some sort of a coordination mechanism, and we're doing that in so many other sectors. We're doing that in financial, in financial oversight, for example. You know, now these are new entities, they're new uh, uh, institutions. They need to be tested. They need to be sort of honed and seasoned. But that is, I think, a, a visible, practical solution, uh, short of having a you know omnibus uh, infrastructure ministry, which may have its own problems. So you make mistakes, and nobody is there to sort of provide the checks and balances. But I think the more fundamental challenge is the level of uh, is the vertical coordination, which is how do you bring uh, an alignment between the interests of local stakeholders, land, landless, others, uh, environment issues, state level jurisdictions, because infrastructure generates benefits often across state borders, and the capture of returns is, is a little difficult, and then the national policy. So to us, I think that's that's the framework within which infrastructure strategy needs to be created. Uh, and we've attempted this. I think the biggest learning from the late 90s experience is if you have a single jurisdiction, you're going to get a very good response to a sensible policy. Uh, and telecom demonstrates that. Telecom is going through other challenges now, but there's nothing to do with the way in which it, it evolved in the late 90s. Uh, so that learning is, I think, very much a part of the way that infrastructure strategy is being developed. But you, you have to have uh, some consistency and, and uh, coordination between different levels or different jurisdictions. It's not easy to achieve, but uh, I mean, that's where the effort is. You know. And in fact, in the, uh, uh, before the NIF was created, those, it was still maybe there. Uh, sort of project monitoring function within the Prime Minister's office, just head-banging on the conflicts between different authorities. You, know, you get them into a room and you sort of try to solve it. So there are 
there are very practical nuts and bolts kinds of mechanisms that you need to uh, to, to accomplish. Uh, on the issue of uh, you said landless. Now, to me, that is a larger challenge of why are there so many people in agriculture or in the rural areas? You know, why is this? You know, we have demonstrated exactly the same development pattern as every other country that went before us. The shifting share of GDP from agriculture to other sectors. But we've been an exception, and I think of perhaps the unique exception in not moving the labor force. You know, every other country has seen a parallel dynamic between GDP share and labor force share. We haven't seen that. So that to me is the fundamental issue. Why are people not moving into jobs? And part of it is because infrastructure is inadequate. The cost of people moving is very high. Uh, their ability to manage their sort of social context and their, their employment opportunities is very difficult. So even if you have jobs being generated, and we of course we have massive migration, but it's not accommodating the entire you know potential workforce. So I think somewhere infrastructure <coughs> can play a role in this. And, you know, it's tangible. If you travel in India, you realize that if a four-lane highway comes about within two years, you see such sort of massive development uh, along the, uh, the, the, the the way. And what it does, I have experienced this personally because I used to drive every year from Delhi to Agra, which while the NH2 segment was being built, unbelievable transformations in, in just a few years. And what this means is that people who are looking for jobs out of a rural homestead, earlier they could at most travel five kilometers because it took them so long to get from home to work. Now they're going 30, 40, 50 kilometers uh, because it takes an hour to get there. It's a, it's a normal urban commute. So the range with, uh, that people can, can move uh, to work has in, in, increased dramatically. So that allows concentration, that allows scale economy, that allows governments to say put up industrial parks which then add to the productivity of, of enterprise instead of fragmenting and localizing enterprise. So I think these are things that it's exactly like I was talking about the GST and its impact on, you know, highways become twice as or thrice as more productive because you have the GST. That's not an issue that people have focused on much, but I think that's a very important linkage. Uh, so I think here the issue is if you're creating infrastructure, you're expanding the geographic range within which people can legitimately, practically look for jobs and get investment in those areas. I think that's how the linkage develops. And the related point, as I said, uh, last mile connectivity. And ultimately, it's not just a rural problem, it's an urban problem as well. You try getting out of a city in India. You have a great highway 20 kilometers out of the city, but to get to Travel those 20 kilometers, it takes you. But, and why is this? Because the last mile infrastructure is not mile. Right. So I think the challenge is the same, whether it's urban connectivity or rural connectivity, whether it's water, transport, or anything else. That prioritization, allowing resources to come from outside private sector to focus on the big ticket, you know, predictable return projects, yeah. allows the government to then focus perhaps a little more exclusively, uh, with a little more sort of muscle and resources and, and attention on these last mile issues. So I think I see a complementarity between the uh, the sort of increased presence, increased contribution of private investment and private activity on the big tickets, the big linkages, the highway system, the ports and so on. Uh, and more local, and there are local issues also. This is not just, you know, Delhi deciding uh, five mile or five kilometer connectivity in Tamil Nadu is sure. about the local authority. Are you enabling the local authorities to think in this way? I think that's a very important uh, consideration as well. So that's how specialization, I think, is where uh, this problem needs to be addressed. And so urban, you know, municipal capacities, they're limited. Yeah. Uh, they're not strategic. And so as it brings some of that strategic thinking into uh, local levels of government as well. I think, you know, we work with the World Bank, associated with, with, uh, with the social enterprise. Capacity development at the ground level is, I think, a very fundamental topic, whether it's regulation or you know, thinking, reconciling with the big picture. Uh, that's an investment, that's an activity that I think institutions in Washington and elsewhere should be also thinking about, which I don't think they're putting enough emphasis on. So I'm 
putting the, throwing the ball back to you and say, you know, you go out and do your, your trying, things. Like trying, that. absolutely. I think there was a, uh, that was very useful and inspiring. I, I, I completely agree with you. There is a, there's a big gap when it comes to social enterprise and last mile. Everyone wants to, you know, even the World Bank, the large projects go after the large ticket disbursement oriented, uh, uh, you know, incentives. Yeah, small ticket size, but spread over multiplied by 200,000 times, that is also big ticket size, yeah. but it's more operationally intensive. So the inst big institutions here tend to shy away from that. And I'm part of the force trying to change that <laughs> with your inspiration. Adrian, do you want to answer the question that I Yeah, I know we're short of time, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be brief. So the context is that the fund, Homeland Security, set up a fake university and uh, in Induced students or learned students into applying for a university that didn't exist with the intention that those students can then extend their stay uh, in the United States. Uh, my personal view on this is that, um, you know, as you were slightly, um, I think, you know, leaning towards uh, Urban Ash, was that students were then given a choice that they were otherwise not presented with, which is come to a university. We will then give you all of the administration documentation requirements to extend your stay, but knowing that that doesn't exist. And when you present someone with two choices, whether they go down a legal route and look at the options in front of them, or there's this option that's presented with all the bells and whistles, you know, clearly human nature is to consider the best option as it's presented to you. Did some of those students know that those credentials were not real or not? that depends on each one of the student cases um, but even if they did to present them you know those options in, in the first place I think was, was quite harsh yeah I think to address that there needs to be more accountability on the universities here the credible universities on uh, doing their due diligence and KYC on the students that they're taking on board you know this has become a very profitable source of income for US universities and they were claim that that's the case, but it is a tremendous um, source of investment, the 7.5 billion that I mentioned. And I think there is accountability for the universities here that do want to, to recruit students, to take more care, and to be better informed and better governed internally about the students they're taking on. When you then have these fake universities or universities that have no intention of providing the education. education and social care that frankly a young immigrant would want in America, then you know then, then those institutions shouldn't be granted the right or given the right to, to, to recruit certainly the numbers that, that, that they could. And I think you know that despite it being a major economic contributor, it's 39 billion dollars overall to the US economy student um, uh, international student recruitment. That is a significant industry that does deserve much better structure and governance around it. And I think that's, that's due to come. And again, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, if you actually have a strategic plan which sets out to the key countries, China, which they've got separate issues on, India, and, and the way that these students come, the way that they then apply for longer term visas if they want to stay, whether that's through OPT and H1B and beyond, be clear on those. And you know, by and large, 99.7% of the Indian students coming here will adhere to those rules and regulations. But that's got to be a systematic approach all the way through. At the moment, there's a bit here, a bit there, different agency representing different interests, and it's therefore very difficult for, for, for a student um, to, to, to kind of work his or her way through that system. I want to point out that not only have we managed to bring three uh, not so much talked about sectors over here in the US, but have also, I just realized, managed to be a very gender neutral panel. Uh, <laughs> so I want to thank all my panelists, Dr. Gokran, for giving the insight on infrastructure investments in India. Sophia, who talked about pharmaceutical in India, the US, and Adrian, who talked about higher education. And I hope that we talk more about these three sectors.
for sharing your very, very insightful discussions. Um, I want to thank our sponsors as well, for sponsors, EP, and uh, our Seeger Center for the generous support. I hope all of you will come back and see us and continue to engage with us.